the subject tonight is in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, um, we're down in verse number uh, 10 of Luke chapter 12. This is probably, I think, one of the most misunderstood scriptures that's out there. Uh, I do think that uh, when you read across this text, it give it it sends chills down your spine. If you ever think of being forgiven and you think of God forgiving things, this is one of those passages that that when you read it, if you believe the Word of God and every word of the Word of God, and I do, I'm I'm a, um, I, I believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture. I am a a total uh, Bible believer, and I believe that even the verb tense. I believe in the plenary of verbal inspiration. I believe that God even put the verb tense and how He meant it to say it. I, I just believe God is that. I, I'm, I believe He is that detailed. And when you see that, uh, you you make it to this passage in Luke chapter twelve, begin reading in verse ten, down in verse ten, in verse ten. He gets to the subject, and this is right after he talks about about confession. We went over that uh, last week and about denying before the angels of God. And then in verse 10 he says, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Now that's a strong statement. To not be forgiven. Now, in order to really grasp what this talks about, you've got to look at it in the other Gospels. He actually mentions it in the book of Luke, but he does not give the what's in front of it or what's behind it. He goes into a, a different subject, and he goes into to, to talking about the Holy Ghost teaching us, and we'll look at that a little bit later. But we need to look at it in the other text to be able to, to understand. Look in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3 and verse 28 and 29. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 28 and 29. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Uh, I had, uh, when I was in, in uh, Bible college, I had a professor that every time it said the word ghost in spirit, he would, uh, he would read spirit. He wouldn't say ghost. He said it had a spooky connotation. I said, it don't to me. I think of a ghost of being a personal. And I said, I don't have any problem. If it says Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, I don't have any problem. Uh, I believe he's one God. And I, think, I think of a ghost, and I said, it, it doesn't bother me to say the Holy Ghost. Uh, but here he says, and this is in the passage, same, talking about the same thing, but he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. Aren't you glad the Bible says that? Amen. Are you glad it said all sins uh, shall be forgiven unto the sons of men? I like that. And blasphemies, it says, whereof, uh, with, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. Look at verse 29. He says, but in verse 29, it says, But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal, what? That's strong. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I actually, uh, if you go back and you study and you look at it, and you can look at it in Greek, you can look at definitions, and it means just what it says. And the word blaspheme means to speak hurtfully, and it, it means to, uh, we use the words like cursing, we use words like that. I mean, those are, are kind of interchangeable words as he's talking about there. But what is he talking about? In order to understand Scripture, you should always look at Scripture in context of Scripture. In, in Mark, I want you to look there with me in Mark. If you've got your Bible open, you'll understand uh, what's going on. Look in Mark so we'll understand. He does not really uh, cover it in depth in Luke. And so let's look at it in Mark. Uh, actually, uh, someone asked me about uh, something one time. They talked about spiritual gifts. And they, they said, because I didn't believe uh, that the spiritual gifts that they said they had uh, I told them I wasn't sure about that, and I told them I wasn't sure that was of the Holy Spirit. They said, oh, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I said, no, 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 I can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and I'll show you that in a little bit uh, for the child of God. But in Mark, 
always look at Scripture in context of Scripture. You say, what's going on? In Mark chapter 3, in verse 20 through 22 through 27, is in context of where that subject comes from. In verse 22 through 27, he says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. And by the prince of the devils has he cast out devils. They're accusing Jesus of casting out devils by the work of Satan. They said that Jesus was not doing his work through the Holy Spirit, but he was doing it through the power of the devil. And look on down. He says, And he called them unto him, and he said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? You say, why would Jesus say? Jesus always loved to teach with a question. He would confront people with a question because it put them on defense to make them uh, be able to, to, to have to defend their position. And, they, and then he goes on to say, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Do you believe that? If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Do you believe that? And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. He says, But no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Now, what he's talking about is you've got to be more powerful than the person you're going to rob if you're going to tie him up and take his stuff. You're going to have to, you need the, the larger muscle. You need the bigger gun. You need the bigger power. If you want to take somebody's stuff, then you've got to be the one to take it. You've got to be the one capable of doing what you said. And he says that if, if Satan is casting out Satan, he said he's divided against himself. He said, I was able to go in under the devils and get them out because I'm stronger than the devils is what he was telling them. I was able to have power over them because the spirit by which I'd done my miracles was stronger than the spirit that was in them. And then he says this. He says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. Now hold on. Who is he talking to? He is talking to the scribes there. He's talking to those people that was accusing him of casting out devils by the power of the devil. And then he says this. He says, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of man, and blasphemies wherewith shall whithersoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Why did he say it? He says it in the next verse. He says, Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. He says the reason Jesus said that was because they told him that he was of the devil. They told Jesus that he was operating and had the power of Satan in him to cast out Satan. And he said that's why he answered like he did. The context that I've heard it used has nothing to do with the Bible definition. It just has to do with people that say, oh, you're speaking against that which I believe, therefore you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. No. The Bible talks about speak hurtfully or attribute the works of God unto Satan. He said, you say, well, how would someone do that in today's time? I'm not sure we can, number one. But let's look at it in Scripture. I want to, 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 to look at this. If we're to speak hurtfully against the Holy Ghost, then he has to be the one doing the work. Did you realize that God is the one that draws man to salvation? Let me give you three scriptures. Uh, Romans, chapter, um, Romans chapter 3 and verse 11. Romans chapter 3 and verse 11. Let me give you three scriptures real quick back to back. Romans chapter 3 and verse 11. The Bible said, There is none that understandeth, and there is none that seeketh after God. Did you realize that the natural man does not go after God? 
He doesn't do it. We come into this world, the natural man does not want anything to do with God. The Bible said it is at enmity. That means it is against God. It does not want anything to do with God. You wonder why people walk around. The Bible says, And the nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. And people wonder, How can people in that country walk around and not even have a desire? Listen, God, the Bible said, The grace that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace, even through creation, the Bible reveals, that there is a God, no doubt. But we need missionaries to tell the story. We need missionaries to tell the story. Why? Because just because they can see that there is a God throughout creation, just because the grace of God hath appeared to all men, does not mean that every man has heard a clear presentation of the gospel. I wish they had heard a clear presentation of the gospel, but they have not. But the Bible said there's none that seeketh after God. We say, well, what happens then? Well, I'll tell you. Look in uh, John chapter 6 and verse 44. How then does a man get saved? John 6, 44. In John 6, 44, it says, No man can come to me, this is Jesus talking, except the Father which sent me, what is that next word? Draw him. That is the drawing or the wooing of the Holy Spirit of God. People wonder, say, well, I wonder if, if I blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I don't want to do that because I want to go toward God. <laughs> if there is none that seeketh after God and you're seeking after God, you definitely have not blasphemed the Holy Ghost because the Bible says you cannot even be drawn toward God without the Holy Spirit doing the drawing. So if you're asking that question, that's a good sign <laughs> that you hadn't crossed that deadline because there is none that seeketh after God. The Father draws men unto himself. You ever been drawn by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Amen. You ever been drawn? Yes. If, if you know, you know, you ever rejected that drawing? I have. Yeah. I have turned him away at times. But I'm glad I said yes one time. Amen. Right. That I come. But what happens when we do reject? I believe Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 and 8 kind of gives us a natural response when we reject the drawing or the wooing of the Holy Spirit of God. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8. I know it's a lot of scriptures, but I like scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith. Isn't that who we're talking about? Okay. Today, if you will hear his voice, what do you do with it? Look in verse 8. He says, Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation and in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Do you remember when King Agrippa came and was talking to Paul and Paul tried to convince him to be saved? I believe with all my heart the Holy Spirit of God was drawing old, King, old Agrippa. He was drawing him to him. And he says, almost Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But he said, in other words, he said, not today, buddy, not today, but I'll call for you in a more convenient season. In a more convenient time, I'll call you back to myself. Now, I want to say this. You don't get saved just when you want to. You get saved when the Holy Spirit of God draws on you. <laughs> because you won't want to <laughs> if the Holy Spirit's not doing the drawing. He needs to be doing And that's the reason the Bible says, harden not your hearts in the day of provocation. When the Spirit of God's drawing, you need to move when God is moving on your heart. Because I can guarantee you, you've been moved or drawn by God. And when you say no, it's harder next time for God to draw you. <laughs> and the more you say no, the harder it is. You know what? Oh, hard. Getting harder and harder and harder. The more we reject the gospel, I believe we get harder and and harder and harder. We harden our hearts as we do that. You say, well, what about the child of God? Can the child of God blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Well, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20. If it means to speak hurtfully uh, or to, to curse or attribute his works unto the devil... If we need the Holy Spirit to draw man and we send him away or we speak hurtfully to him and send him away, Dr. J. Harold Smith preached a sermon. If you've never heard it, God's Three Deadlines, 
it'll make you shake in your boots. If you've never heard it, he actually did a series. Uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell years ago had a series of preachers. He had Dr. Jerry Vines and he had different ones that came and spoke. That's where David Ring uh, came and spoke, where he became famous, the one with cerebral palsy that said, I can't even say Jesus why. And he says, healthy people, what your problem? And he was a preacher. I mean, when he, he said, man, he convicted me. I wanted to run saying, oh, God, I, please, Lord, help me. And uh, he, But he went, Dr. J. Harold Smith preached this in that, in that series, God's Three Deadlines. And he says God's Three Deadlines, and he talked about one, and he talks about sending away your day of grace. And that comes from Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. We'll look at that in just a minute. But... Uh, the one of the things he talks about is to speak hurtfully or push away the Holy Spirit of God when he's dealing with you and send him away. And he said in all of his years, if you've ever heard that sermon, he said he'd only saw a handful of people ever do that. And he said he's not saying the Bible says that it happens this way. He said, but every one of them I have ever seen cross that deadline, he said, did not live 24 hours. Now I want you to know, that's pretty strong. He said, I've seen just a few folks cross that deadline, and he said, not one of them. He said he was preaching a, Dr. J. Harold Smith was preaching a, cru, a crusade one time years ago, and he says that there was, uh, during the invitation, he asked people to come. Come to Jesus. Come right now. The Holy Spirit of God is leading and God. Come to Jesus right now. And he said there was three guys that stood up on the back row back there, had been drinking, and they came into the crusade and stood up on the back row of the pew back there and said, well, started joking and making fun. And he goes, oh, there goes one of you drinking buddies. Oh, ho, ho, I guess he won't. And he said, he's steady doing the invitation, and they're hollering out loud. He said, oh, there goes your girl you're just going to meet after a while. There she goes. And he said, sir, would you please sit down? And he said, the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with you. And he said, the man looked up and he said, you and the Holy Spirit can both go to hell. And he says, when he said that, he said he felt like God says, don't touch him. <laughs> don't, don't get your hands off from Don't say another word to him. They said after that service, they said they was left that service and went somewhere, and within 24 hours, he said the first two had already died, and he was a Christian doctor in the service, and he says a guy that was in the town, he come to him, and he says, Doc, he said, I'm hurting on the insides, and he says, I feel like, he said, before the day's out, I'm going to be dead. My other two buddies are dead, and I feel like I'm going to be dead before the day's out. And he says the guy doubled over and died. And he says, when he died, he said, I put on the death certificate, causes unknown. But he said, if I could write on there what I really thought, I'd have wrote, God killed him. <laughs> now, I want you to know, that's getting serious. I do not believe in messing with an almighty God that has the power of life and death. He can tell your heart to stop beating anytime he wants to do it. He can tell your lungs and your brain to stop communicating with each other and you will stop breathing right that moment. We don't need to play around a holy God. But as a child of God, can I send away the Holy Spirit? How? Well, let me show you something. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the what? temple of the Holy Ghost, which is where? where? Where's the Holy Spirit of God? In the believer. Which ye have of God, ye are not your own. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Did you know what? The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God moved in, took over, took ownership, and has the title deed to your flesh. Aren't you glad to know that? He owns that. You can't send him away because he owns that. That'd be like you trying to come kick me out of my house. You ain't kicking me out of my house. It's my house. Now, my youngin may kick me out of my bed some night. 
it, she's done it before. Coming in with them little elbows and knees. It's amazing. And they're that age. How them elbows and knees can get up under your ribs. Amen. They can turn sideways. And I, I mean, they can do it. But you know, when he's talking, when Jesus is talking about, you first got to be stronger than the, the, the one in the house in order to take him out. Someone stronger than the Holy Spirit of God would have to come in in order to get him out. And the last time I checked, there ain't nobody stronger than the Holy Spirit of God. He is God, the part of the Trinity, and we are not our own. We are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You can't kick out the Holy Spirit from a child of God. Why? Because you're not your own. You don't have the authority anymore to do that. You give up the deed. You can't take it back. There ain't no take backs. When you're born into the family of God, you are His. You say, for how long? I believe with all my heart that I received everlasting life. I believe the moment that I received Christ, I believe it was forever. The transaction says in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, it says that I am sealed until the day of redemption. You say, why did he put that seal on there? Because if I could lose it, I would lose it. <laughs> he knew I would. And listen, if I could have lost my salvation, I'd have lost it many a times. I've lost my religion a few times. So any of y'all ever lost your religion? Yeah, and driving is a good way to lose your religion. I was coming down New Zion Road the other day, pulled out. Somebody was going about 70, I think, on the road, got right on my bumper and just tried to push me as far as they could. I was going 45, and they was just, mm, and I told the girls, put on your seat belts. Why? I said, because I'm just to hit my brakes. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But I thought about it. I, I did. I, I, I know none of y'all's never thought about doing that. I, I thought about making them gobbling up the whole rear end. Amen. Tommy's thought about it. He put his head down. Amen. But, but I have lost a lot of things. But I can tell you what. I can't lose something I don't possess. You say, well, how do you know you don't possess it? Because of John chapter 10. The Bible says the moment I've saved, Jesus says that I am in his hand. And he says, no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. Then he says that my Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He said, I'm in the hand of the Son. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm in the hand of the Son. I'm in the hand of the Father. And he says, no man is that. You have to be stronger than the one that holds me in order to do it. And you, I'll tell you what. The Holy Spirit ain't getting kicked out of the child of God. Can a child of God blaspheme the Holy Ghost? No, 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 10,000 times no, because we are not our own. We cannot. He owns us. And I also know this. If you're a child of God and you even get close to talking bad about him, he convicts you. You ever notice that? You ever notice that when you start even talking bad about attributing the works of God to the works of the devil? You ever notice he goes <coughs> in your spirit and you're like, maybe I don't understand all that, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you, I'm telling you, you, you just, you don't have to understand it. It's something about you know that you're treading in areas that you shouldn't tread in. You understand. I don't, under, I don't know why, but I know that the Holy Spirit says, boy, you are treading around areas you don't want to get into. And he'll convict you. And he'll make you turn away. But look in Titus chapter 2 in verse number 11. Titus 2, 11. The Bible talks about this and it's talking about the grace that brings salvation. The grace that bringeth salvation hath appeared to who? All men. Aren't you glad that the grace that brings salvation appears to everybody? I am. But just because the grace has appeared to everybody, every breath an infidel breathes, is the grace of God. Every breath that Hitler ever took in in his life was the grace of God. He was a wicked, vile man, but he lived under the grace of God every day of his life that he lived. The grace of God has appeared to all. I tell you what, he's done better for us if he did nothing else for us. Even a lost person, he, he has given you so much. But let's go on in our text. When he says here about the Holy Spirit, 
when he says here, but in him that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. I know good and well that's not talking about the child of God because my Bible says if I confess my sins as a child of God, he is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You say, how do you know that was wrote to you? Because 1 John is written to my little children. In this text, he's talking to the scribes. He's not talking to the disciples. I'm glad I'm one of his. Aren't you glad you're one of his? I am glad I am one of his. I tell you what, though. It's dangerous ground for man to be walking on. For God to say you can never be forgiven. But what about this Holy Spirit? What about the Holy Ghost he's talking about here? He says, and when they bring you in the synagogues and under the magistrates, uh, magistrates and the powers, take ye no thought of how or what ye shall say or that ye answer. Or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you. What's going on? I want you to know, he's saying, listen, the Holy Ghost will teach you. He shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Now, I want you to know, look in John chapter 14, verse 26. I love that the Holy Spirit of God can give us what we need to say. If you ever said, I don't know how to witness to somebody, and then all of a sudden you did? You ever said, I don't know how to do that, and then all of a sudden preacher puts you on the spot. Says, here, we got some, a little boy over here. Needs to talk to somebody. Here, would you go take him back there and talk to him? Oh, no. I, I, okay, I'll go. You go back there and you say, all right, you know, the Bible says, oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And son, if you'll trust Christ right now, just, when I was a young and I asked Jesus in my heart, I meant it with all my heart. I, I give my heart to Jesus. You can do it right now if you want to. You almost feel like you're going to mess it up. Like I, you can do it if you want to. Or you can wait and see the preacher. You got, I want to. You sure you want to pray right now? Well, the preacher will be done in just a minute. <laughs> and they're like, no, I won't. No, I won't do it right now. Oh, all right. Well, just bow your head. Tell God what's on your heart. They go, I don't know what to say. All right, here we go. Tell him you're a sinner. And you want him to say it. And you believe he died for it. And you mean it. Do you mean it? You know he died and rose again? Yeah. You sorry for your sin? Yeah. You done wrong, hey? You sorry? All right. Let's, let's do this. They get down on their knees and they go, Dear Jesus, please save me. <coughs> I've been, I've done bad. Sometimes they'll get detailed. Hey, I've been bad to my little brother and my little sister, and I, 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 I don't obey my mama, and, and I've and I done this, and I kicked the dog, and, and I, 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 I mean, I, I mean that, they'll get detailed in the whole, sometimes they do. You don't know, you don't know what's on their heart. The Holy Spirit of God's convicting them of their sin. That's right. He's not convicting them of your sin. He's convicting them of their sin. And they're like, I know you died. No, please, I'm sorry. Would you save me, God? Amen. And they look up and you go, I want to make sure I didn't mess that up. I think you got saved. You don't tell them that, but you say, yeah, you want to go tell the preacher what just happened here? Yeah. All right. You bring them out and the preacher's like, Try to talk to them. You probably won't talk to them more. You won't, you, you won't deal with them at church. You know, they'll be done just a minute. You have plenty of time to talk to them. Because you don't want to be the one to confuse them. Amen. You're like, yeah, he'll, he'll be glad to talk to you just a little bit later. And, and you know, I, I done the best I could do, but here, here you go. Don't ever do that to me again. Here, here he is right here. That's why we pay you. Here, here we go. And, and you turn them over back, back to preach, and the preacher carries them through and tells them what Jesus done on Calvary's cross and everything. And they go, I done that back there. <laughs> I give my life to Jesus. And you ask him, say, well, if you was to die, where'd you go? I'd go to heaven. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus, <laughs> Kevin, my, I give him my life and he, my, I got saved. You look at them and they're just like, whoo, man, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where scripture turned to. I was lost. I, just, I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden I remember. You know what just happened? 
the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and shall bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit remembers all those scriptures you've forgotten? <laughs> Aren't you glad that same person you led to Christ when you was 20 years old and you was dealing with them kids and you don't know nothing about it and here you are 70 years old and you might not have led nobody to Christ from the time you was 20 all the way to you 70 shame on you by the way but if you didn't do it all the time from you was 20 to the time you was 70 the same scriptures you forgot along the way still works today and the Holy Spirit of God can bring those things and put them back in your mind and make them fresh and brand new again I'm glad God don't forget his word aren't you Amen. the Holy Spirit of God is able to teach you in the same hour you need it look in Matthew chapter 10 verse 19 and 20 Matthew 10 verse 19 and 20 something else the Holy Spirit this is all on the same subject how him teach you. he says he's telling his disciples he says but when they deliver you up take no thought how or what you shall speak for it shall be given you in that same hour you shall speak. Verse 20. He says, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Do you know that God can tell you what to say? I was scared to death. One time I went to a Hare Krishna farm and I was scared to death to talk to him. I really was. I've told you this before. There was in Peking, Mississippi, there's a little gas station there that I used to stop at and get gas. And there's a Hare Krishna farm that's out between Picune and Carrier. That's a farm. They grow stuff, but it's a compound that they actually live at. Hare Krishnas, they, they recruit them off the streets of New Orleans down there, but there's a farm out there. And you've got to go through a gate to get there and all, but they, you'll see them around and they'll see you have those little um, flowers. They love those lays that go like, you know, real scented like flowers from India and all. And they'll see them hanging around people's necks and you'll see them from their rear view mirrors. And I used to talk to this, these folks that come to this gas station. I'd talk to them. We'd get talking about Christ. And, and they asked me one day, says, we want you to come to our school. They had their own school for their kids in that compound. We want you to come talk to our kids about what you believe. What is different from what you... We've had a Christians, and we've had a Methodist, and we've had a Mormon, we've had a this, but we want to invite you to come tell us what you believe and do it. He says, and so you'll understand us better. He gave me a copy of their scriptures, which is the Bhagavad Gita. And he, he gave me that, and he gave me some books about... Uh, uh, some some Hindu writers wrote, and he got me several books. And I took them, and I started reading them and trying to figure out how I could dissect what they believe with what I believe. And I could take the Bible, and I could chop them up. And, and, and I mean, I just started looking and reading. And the more I read their stuff and read my stuff, the more I, I felt like a termite in a yo-yo. I mean, I was my mind was just all full of all kind of stuff. And by the time I got there, my mind was just, I mean, clouded. And the Holy Spirit of God says, now that you've studied all of that, throw it all down. Because what was going to happen was, they was going to take what I said doctrinally, they was going to question me. They had canned questions ready to, to, to tear me apart in that room. And when I got done, they was going to hit me with comparative religion and then I was going to leave with my tail tucked between my legs and I was going to walk out and they would win the superior uh, religion in their mind. I, they had it ready. They, why do I eat meat? Bible said and they, they had their, their questions ready to go. And I started into all that and the Holy Spirit said, stop. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. And I just, all of a sudden, I closed up their stuff and I said, the Bible says this is why Jesus came. And I shared the gospel with the whole class. And a young man says, I have a question. And can that. So it was a canned question, ready to go. And he said, the Bible says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And he says, before the fall of man, they didn't eat nothing but herbs in the garden. They didn't eat meat. And so after the fall, they started eating meat. And so if Jesus prayed that we're supposed to, to have it as our Father was in heaven, then Jesus is teaching that we shouldn't eat meat. And so why do you still eat meat? And the Holy Spirit of God says, I said, the Bible, Paul said, I'll eat no meat nor drink wine if it calls my brother to offend. And I looked at that young man. I said, young man, if I thought for one second that if me not eating meat, that you would turn away from what you believe and turn to trust Christ today and give your heart to Christ, I'll never eat meat again as long as I live if that'll bring you to Christ. And I want you to know that class shut down quick. The teacher went, all right, we appreciate you being here. We need to get you. And they wanted to rush me out of there. Now, the boy didn't get saved, and I left there and got a double meat burger. Amen. I, I was I left starving to death. But I want you to know, the Holy Spirit of God gave me what I needed at that moment. And I guarantee you, that young man was not expecting the love of Christ to reach out to him and say, Son, you're more important to me than a burger. You're more important than anything. That Jesus, if he can give up heaven and walk on earth, I'll give it up for you. And that young man, man, it got a hold of him. You know what happened? Holy Spirit teaching. The Holy Spirit of God given us in the hour in which we speak. Let me give you another scripture. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. I'm going to give you two. This one, one more scripture, and we'll shut her down. Mark chapter 13, verse 11 says this. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do you premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but who? But the Holy Ghost. Look in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. You know why we need to be close to the Spirit of God? Because He can speak through us what needs to be done. I believe in our day and time, He speaks through His Word. I believe that. But I know he'll bring the remembrance scriptures you thought you forgot so long ago. The Bible says this in 1 John 2, 27, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as that same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as this hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Do you know the Holy Spirit of God can bring this book to life to you? He can, he can bring it alive. There's a lot of folks that say, how do you understand the Bible? The Holy Spirit of God flips those lights on. I love it when I'm in a, my devotion time or I'm just reading the Word of God. And it's like, oh, you ever done that? what that means. And it's something you've studied a long time ago and something you'll read it and it'll be like oh well that goes with uh, and you start putting stuff together and man you feel like CSI. You feel like you have just stumbled on to the DNA to solve the case. And it's a new truth that God gives you. What a great, what a great God we have. I tell you what, we don't need to act on our own power. We need to act on His power. But the Spirit of God that dwells in you, He'll guide you. He'll teach you. He says in this, in this passage, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Verse 13 through 15 actually is a different subject altogether. And I love the fact the next verse we're going to get into is Jesus didn't even get, want to get involved in civil things that was going on. I like that. Do you know what? I think we get too bogged down with things that don't matter. We do. We get so worked up about things that's not going to last anyway. It's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. I've seen brothers lose their cool in relationship over a car, 
over a fence, over an acre of land, over a thousand dollar CD, never speak to each other again, over a thousand dollar CD, over things that don't even matter. You know what? This old world's this old world's not going to be here forever. We need to be busy doing the work of the Lord. Let's stand.